Hopkins, Chapter 4. Mr. Hopkins did not last very long as overseer. Why his career was so short, I do not know, but I suppose he was not strict enough to suit Colonel Lloyd. After Mr. Hopkins came Mr. Austin Gore, a man who had every quality his employer could wish. Mr. Gore had worked for Colonel Lloyd in one of the out farms and had shown himself worthy of the important job of overseer at Great House Farm. Mr. Gore was proud and ambitious. He was also clever, cruel, and stubborn. He was just the man for such a place. He was one of those who could see rudeness in the slightest look, word, or gesture from a slave, and he would treat it accordingly. There must be no answering back to him. A slave was never allowed any explanation to show that he had been wrongfully accused. Mr. Gore fully believed the slaveholder's rule. It is better to whip a dozen slaves wrongfully than to let the slaves see that the overseer has made a mistake. It didn't matter how innocent a slave might be. Once he had been accused by Mr. Gore of any fault, to be accused was to be found guilty, and to be found guilty was to be punished. The only way to escape punishment was to escape accusation, and few slaves managed that under Mr. Gore's supervision. He was, of all the overseers, the most dreaded by the slaves. His presence was painful. His glance created confusion all around him, and his sharp, shrill voice produced horror and trembling among them. Although Mr. Gore was a young man, he indulged in no jokes, made no funny remarks, and seldom smiled. His words were in perfect keeping with his looks, and his looks were in perfect keeping with his words. Overseers will sometimes indulge in a witty word, even with the slaves, but not so with Mr. Gore. He spoke only to command, and commanded to be obeyed. He was stingy with his words, and generous with his whip, and he never used the former when the latter would do. His savage barbarity was equaled only by the coolness with which he committed the most savage deeds upon the slaves under his supervision. Mr. Gore once began to whip one of Colonel Lloyd's slaves by the name of Denby. He had given Denby only a few stripes when, to ease the pain, Denby ran and plunged himself into a creek. He stood there in water up to his shoulders, refusing to come out. Mr. Gore told him that he would count to three, and if he did not come out, he would shoot him. Mr. Gore began to count. Denby made no answer, but stood his ground. The counting continued with no response from Denby. Without a word to anyone, Mr. Gore then raised his rifle, took deadly aim at his standing victim, and in an, in, in an instant, poor Denby was no more. His mangled body sank out of sight, and blood and brains marked the water where he had stood. A shudder of horror flashed through every soul upon the plantation, excepting Mr. Gore. He seemed cool and collected. He was asked by Colonel Lloyd and my old master why he had taken this extraordinary action. His reply was that Denby had become unmanageable. He was setting a dangerous example to the other slaves, one which, if allowed to pass, would lead to the end of rule and order on the plantation. He argued that if one slave refused to be corrected and escaped with his life, the other slaves would soon copy his example. The result, said Mr. Gore, would be the freedom of the slaves and enslavement of the whites. Mr. Gore's explanation satisfied them. He kept his job and became widely known as an excellent overseer. He was not even charged with a crime. He was committed in the presence of slaves, and they, of course, could not bring jar charges against him or even testify against him. And so the perpetrator of a bloody, foul murder goes unpunished and uncriticized by his own community. Gore lived in St. Michael's, Talbot County, Maryland, when I, lived, when I left there. He probably lives there now, as much respected as if his soul had not been stained with the, his brother's blood. In Talbot County, killing a slave or any other black is not treated as a crime. Thomas Landman of St. Michael's killed two slaves. He killed one with a hatchet, knocking his brains out. He used to boast about the awful deed. I have heard him laugh as he did so, saying that others should thank him and do as he had done. That way, the country soon would be rid of... The wife of Mr. Giles Hicks, who lived near where I used to live, murdered my wife's cousin, a girl of only fifteen or sixteen. She mangled the poor girl in the most horrible manner, so that she lived only a few hours. The victim was immediately buried, but had been in her untimely grave only a few hours before she was dug up and examined by the coroner, who decided that she had been killed by a severe beating. This is what happened. She had been told to mind Mrs. Hicks' baby, and during the night she fell asleep and the baby cried. She had not slept for several nights and did not hear the crying. 
She and the infant were both in the room with Mrs. Hicks. When Mrs. Hicks found the girl slow to move, she jumped from her bed, seized a stick of wood by the fireplace, and beat the girl with it, breaking her nose and breastbone. I will not say that this horrid murder did not scandalize the community. It did create a scandal, but not enough to bring the murderess to punishment. A warrant was issued for her arrest, but it was never served. She escaped punishment, and even the pain of being brought before a court. While I am telling of bloody deeds which took place during my stay on Colonel Lloyd's plantation, I will briefly tell of one more, which occurred about the same time as the murder of Demby by Mr. Gore. Colonel Lloyd's slaves were in the habit of spending a part of their nights and Sundays fishing for oysters, so as to make up for their scanty diet. An old man belonging to Colonel Lloyd was oystering, and happened to wander beyond the limits of Colonel Lloyd's property and on to the property of Mr. Beale Bondley. Mr. Bondley took offense at his trespass, came down to the shore with his rifle, and shot the poor old man dead. Mr. Bondley came over to see Colonel Lloyd the next day. I don't know whether he came to pay him for his property or to justify what he had done. At any rate, the whole devilish act was soon hushed up. There was very little said about it at all, and nothing done. It was a common saying, even among the little white boys, that it was worth half a penny to kill a and half a penny to bury one.